Hello, this is voice actor Wally Wingert and the Riddler, Edward Nigma. Hello. <laughs> and Adam West, the 1966 Batman with superhero stuff. You should know. You should know this too, Riddler, you foul fiend. I know everything, you cowled clod. And you, Wingert. Yeah, you're right. I know nothing. Sorry. All right, but you got to be sure to listen because I'm going to be the guest and it'll be fun and long. Welcome to Superhero Stuff You Should Know, a Superhouse podcast. This is Ben, the man who knows too much about Batman, and I'm here with... Andrew, everybody, what's going on? I'm here to learn, here to learn and glean all the bat tutelage, and I guess Riddler tutelage mainly for this episode, and uh, we're here with... Yes, if you've played any of the Arkham games, this man has taunted, criticized, chastised, and straight up irritated the hell out of you <laughs> and that's before he makes you hunt after 500 of his question mark trophies. <laughs> this guest the man is... who's loved to be hated yes, uh, <laughs> Batman has Kevin Conroy Joker has Mark Hamill and the Riddler has our guest today please welcome Wally Wingert oh you're Woo! very kind for saying that uh, that was one of the nicest things I'd ever read about myself online kind of accidentally was that um, Wally Wingard is to the Riddler, what Mark Hamill is to the Joker, and I, I regard Mark as being one of the greatest, greatest Jokers of all time. So that was really, really kind of a nice thing to uh, to read about myself. But I don't believe anything about me that I read online. So, but it was <laughs> it was nice for the fleeting few seconds that I actually said, "Oh, well, that's kind of nice." Okay, well, it's not real anyway. Okay, moving on with reality now. <laughs> Never it's read true, anything bro. about yourself online. That's first yeah. rule of thumb. Uh, yeah, it's very true. We've but, been uh, bad about that, Ben. We read very, everything about our read podcast. Every <laughs> <laughs> we, should, uh, we should stop that. Wait till the death threats start coming in. Then you kind of go, eh, maybe I shouldn't check into this quite so often. Okay. okay. Yeah. Riddler Fatwa. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, hey, man, I was wondering if you could share with us how you got started as being a fan of Batman. It, was it through the 1966 show or was it through something else? It was the 1966 show, which came on uh, when I was five years old, uh-huh. uh, and I was smitten because that was that's just the perfect age because you're no longer really a toddler and your just mind is kind of you know full of fluff. Um, this was you know when you get to be about the age of four or five, you start becoming conscious of stuff, which is what they say when you have a kid. Don't take them to Disneyland until they're about four or five because they're not going to remember anything anyway. <laughs> oh right, for sure. So, sure. Yeah. So, um, but that was a, during the, f- the first phase of my impressionable years where I said, wow, I, I really like everything that's going on in this and I, I want to be that guy. And uh, so I, you know, <laughs> like every other kid in America at the time, I went out and bought the cape and mask set and I was running around the neighborhood. I had my own kind of Batman uh, costume that I'd fabricated uh, just on my own, just from junk laying around the house. Um, and I have a picture of it I can send you if you want to post with it. It's uh, sure. <laughs> it's pretty. You know, when you when you look at what I and my five year old imagination imagine me looking like Batman, uh, is you you would look at it and go that that doesn't look anything like Batman. But my <laughs> my dad was in the army, so he had one of those folding caps, you know, that you put on and you you fold it up and then you put it on. It just kind of folds and goes on your head, and it's kind of you know they have a they have a really rude term for him in the military that I won't repeat, but. Um, <laughs> It's, you know, the kind of folding caps, you know, you know, the kind where you. Yeah, I think I have an idea. Two, yes. Yeah. So what I did was I took my dad's army cap. I don't know how I even found this stuff. And I put it on my head sideways. Those were my bat ears. Right. <laughs> oh, okay. Nice. Then nice. I had a towel, like a bath towel, safety pinned around my neck. I had my dad's uh, work gloves, like gardening gloves. Uh, I, we, in the Midwest, you always wear boots, like, uh, because it's always muddy and stuff there. So I had these uh, things called Wellington boots. They weren't really oh, yeah. engineer boots. They weren't cowboy boots, but they were Wellington boots. But I wore boots a lot because I, you know, as a boy, I was a five-year-old boy. I got in the mud a lot. So I, I, I tucked my pant legs into the Wellington boots. I uh, pulled my, t- uh, my uh, sweatshirt out and I put a, uh, my, I think my mom's belt over the shirt, you know, that was my utility belt. And then I found a yellow round pin back button from my dad's college days. Um, when he was in college, they had a thing called Gypsy Days where, you know, for their homecoming, they'd all dress up like gypsies and they'd parade down the street and it was their homecoming. 
So it was, it was a gypsy days, a pin back button with a picture of a gypsy on it, but it was round and it was yellow. Mm -hmm. So I pinned that on my chest and that was my bad insignia. And nice. you're running around the neighborhood dressed like this, you have no clue uh, what I'm doing. But in my mind, I looked <laughs> like Adam West on that TV show. And I, it, it took me years before I had even seen Batman in color. We had a black and white set. My first exposure to Batman, the Adam West Batman in color was the cover of the TV guide. And my oh, grandma yeah. uh, always kept a TV guide in her bathroom. I guess, you know, you're doing your business and you want to see what's, what's on the tube. And uh, so it was there and I would go into the bathroom and I'd go back into the bathroom, go back in the bathroom. I couldn't take my eyes off that TV guide cover because it was the first time I had seen Batman actually in color with the bluish purple, you know, cape and gloves. And the cape was, if you remember that TV guide cover, uh, the cape was uh, uh, hung by a fish line, so it looked like it was, you know, floating behind him, and he oh, was. That's how they did that. He was fl you know, throwing. <laughs> yeah, that's how they did that. Oh, sorry, spoiler alert. <laughs> uh, so they had, uh, but it was it was beautiful, just a beautiful color picture, and I couldn't take my eyes off it. And when I met Jan Kemp, the creator of the uh, Batman costumes uh, for the '66 series, when I met him in '89, and I found out actually who he was. I, I had been, I said, I've been waiting for 30 years to ask you this question. How did you make that cowl? Because I would uh, sit there and obsess over it as a kid looking at these pictures going, how did they make that? How, what is it? it? It's not a helmet, it's cloth, but it's a, it, I, I was obsessed over it. So um, that was my first exposure to color Batman. But uh, for my birthday, remember now, uh, Batman 66 went on the air January 12th, 1966 as a mid-season replacement for um, Ozzy and Harriet. So it didn't come on in the fall. It was a mid-season replacement, which is why season one is so short. It doesn't have the same amount of episodes as your uh, regular uh, full season. So um, in January, I, I found my towel taped around my uh, safety pin around my neck. I found my dad's army cap and I was, I was Batman. Well, for my birthday in May of 66, my folks actually got me a cape and mask from Ben Cooper because they rushed these into production, mask and cape playset. It was a cloth, uh, blue satiny cape with the bat big Batman logo stamped on it. And I was like, Batman doesn't have his logo stamped on the back of his cape. Why would they do this? <laughs> I'm, like analyzing this as a kid, you know. But I was, you know, I put the mask on and I put the thing on. Of course, then they also bought me a Batman uh, T-shirt, which had come out for kids at that because they rushed all this stuff out. They weren't really ready for this mania that had happened. So it was, it was pretty great. So I had my Batman t-shirt on, my, my work gloves, my Wellington boots. Um, I had my uh, cape and my mask on and my friend Galen Albers, I'll never forget his name, my childhood friend. I talked him into getting a Robin cape made and his mom, you know, everybody's, <laughs> everybody's really crafty in the Midwest because they make a lot of their own clothes and those fabric stores about every block. So um, Galen showed up with this yellow cape, you know, with some ties around it so he could tie it around his neck and a black domino mask. And we were Batman and Robin. We'd run around the neighborhood and boy, I'll never forget those days. But That's that was awesome. my first exposure. And it was my first actual exposure to me being conscious of, I want to be, I want to pretend I'm someone else. That was my you know, the right. first thing where, and I didn't know what, it, I didn't know it was called acting. I just knew that I wanted, I liked being somebody else for a while. And then I'd go back to being me. But uh, the second um, incidence of me being aware of that was the Munsters. Uh, and somebody told me something that absolutely changed my life while watching the Munsters. Because here's this kid, Eddie Munster. He's about my age, maybe a little older, a couple of years older. And he gets to wear monster makeup and he gets to be on TV with Frankenstein <laughs> and Dracula and he has a Wolfman doll. And I said, I, I, wanna, I, wanna be, I wanna do that. I wanna be that kid. I wanna dress up in monster makeup and be on TV. And somebody said, told me one thing that changed my young life. And they said, well, you know, Wally, he gets paid to do that. <laughs> and I was like, what? You get to be on TV and you get money? I thought people, I thought people on TV were on TV just because they wanted to be. And they got, they <laughs> got awesome. to be on TV. Yeah, there was no professionalism and there was no money or anything attached to it at all with me. But that was like, oh yeah, well, I, I want to do that. So that, well, I said, well, this is, this is for me. I want to play dress up and, and make money. That'll be really great. And then I found out when I was a teenager that you actually do that and you 
you get paid, you get to be on TV, and you meet girls. That was, a, <laughs> that, was that was the bonus. third that was the third bonus in the whole keeps thing. So it's getting sweeter. It keeps <laughs> getting sweeter. So I, I just never had a problem with knowing what I wanted to do in life. I just always, ever since the age of five, I'm like, nope, I want to play dress up and I want to and I would imitate voices when I was a kid. Uh, in third grade, I learned how to do all the Sesame Street voices, all the Muppet voices. Um, so I was, uh, do, and I would do impersonations. Um, so yeah, the, the whole voice thing started to, to actually uh, pretty young and it, it just kind of pains me to hear people say, oh, I'm 33. I really don't know what I want to do with my life. What are you joking? <laughs> I, I knew what I wanted to do when I was five. So, um, uh, not, not everybody has that luck though. You remind me of whenever in third grade, I remember we got the option in PE to, go from the playground to uh playing kickball and i swear like 95 or percent or more of the people were like let's play kickball i love it and i was like i i was the one i was the five percent that wanted to stay on the playground because that's where the role playing was like yep. i'm gonna be cyclops or i'm gonna be leonardo or i'm gonna be batman like that was my shit and i did not you could tell the nerds real early i guess because <laughs> boy it just it just never changes i mean i'm i'm older than you guys but when i was I had a good friend, still do to this very day. Chris Volley lives in Minnesota. Hi, Chris. Uh, we've been <laughs> friends, best friends since third grade. And he was part of that 5%. No interest in playing kickball with the jocks. Because, you know, the jocks were forming pretty young in life, even in third grade. You right. can tell <laughs> who the athletic guys were. And it, it guess what? Newsflash, it wasn't me. So yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Chris and I would go. We found this little we – we had a playground that, of course, you had your, your – monkeys uh what are they monkey bars monkey bars and you yeah. had your swings and all the other stuff and you had the teeter-totter and everything but there was a uh like a baseball field there was a there was a playing field in my elementary school where you could play baseball you'd have when the weather was nice you'd have outdoor pe there they'd hit you some balls with a bat and you'd field them and throw them back and whatever sometimes they'd play football there they play kickball they play soccer whatever but surrounding the play field was a huge uh shelter belt of trees so you'd have to actually go through a little uh, cutaway in the trees to get to the field. It, it, it separated the field from the school and the asphalt uh, playground. So um, in, that, in that section of trees, there was a little clearing where stuff had, hadn't really kind of grown there. And it was kind of like a little open area. And Chris and I, who also loved Sesame Street at the time, <laughs> would go into... Uh, that area and we were Ernie and Bert and we would that was our apartment and we, we would imp, we would improvise Ernie and Bert sketches now uh, Sesame Street came out uh, when I was in third grade and I remember my uh, third grade teacher how do I remember this stuff I can't remember what I had for breakfast how do I remember in third grade it's sort of a uh, sign of getting on in life I guess but I, uh, I I remember sitting there in class like it was yesterday and Mrs. Wordish my third grade teacher had uh, the Wordish. weekly reader Wordish wow. had the weekly oh, reader. Man. Remember the weekly reader? Did, did you guys have that? Yes, I, vaguely, but yes. Yeah. And she, she was reading us the weekly reader and she said, there's a new TV show. And I was like, TV show. Ooh, what's that? <laughs> and she said, uh, which has a, a, a educational for kids. It's called C same street. <laughs> C same. Oh my God. And I'm like, C same street. Oh, what's C same street? Well, a teacher not knowing how to pronounce Sesame. That's yeah. first of all, that's very odd. But I was like, ooh, C-Same Street, that sounds pretty good. And then I started watching it and realizing it's actually Sesame Street. But, you know, then I, then I discovered these puppets. And I, I'm like, wow, these are really funny. This is not like a kid's show. They're, st they're doing stuff in here that's, that's actually you know, pretty funny for, for a third grade. So I'm not, a, I'm not a toddler. I'm not a three, four-year-old anymore, but this is pretty funny stuff. So I'm telling everybody about this great show called Sesame Street. And they all said, that's a baby show. And I said, no, no, you don't understand. There's these really funny puppets and they do these things and it's really hilarious. They have all these great characters. Well, I didn't, I didn't put two and two together. That was actually the Muppets. Uh, my first dog, my childhood dog was named Ralph, which oh, my perfect. folks named after <laughs> awesome. Rolf on the Jimmy Dean show. And with Jimmy Dean's Southern accent, this is way before you guys time, but with his mm -hmm. Southern accent, they thought he was saying Ralph when he was actually saying Ralph. And they right. thought, well, he's saying Ralph. So my dog was actually named after a Muppet. So it's like, well, that's kind of pr predestination. But I didn't <laughs> put it two and two together that that was the same group of people who did Ralph, who my dog was named after. And then, of course, years later, I became a huge Muppet fan, I even wanted to be a Muppet performer at some point in my life. 
but it's just you're right the role play that's just where all the good stuff happens and then you get into like making the costumes halloween was always really fun because i would always did you guys uh grow up in the time when you had um mask and costume sets and boxes with cellophane windows that uh, that was like a, a little bit there but i think that was more of a, a a bigger deal in 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 previous generations i guess yeah they might have gotten rid of the uh, cellophane window box in favor of the cardboard hangers where yeah, you have the good. mask and the costume uh, on that cardboard hanger we used to have um masks and costumes uh, the costumes were made actually out of fabric uh not great fabric mind you but fabric nonetheless and they would have a little tie sewn into it and it would last one night <clears throat> and then you know it'd be done but um i would never buy those i i very rarely if ever bought a mask and costume set for the very reason i told you earlier well batman's logo isn't isn't <laughs> printed on his cape did they yeah, sell that, superman that, that sets look... with a mask yeah exactly <laughs> well jerry seinfeld has had a great because jerry seinfeld's the a superb number one superman fan mm -hmm. and yeah, he goes i, I never liked those costumes when i was a kid i wanted to be superman <laughs> i would buy the superman costume and put it on and superman's face was on the costume superman's face is not on his own costume yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's as yeah. if they don't think that kids will notice this when kids will notice this more than anybody. Well, it's it's here's the reason they did that is so when you walked up to the door to trick or treat, they didn't have to say, oh, who are you? You know, right, they would just right, the people right. in the yeah. house would just look at your chest. Oh, you're Barnabas Collins. OK, come on in, Barnabas. <laughs> um, so that's why they would they would do that. But I didn't like that. So I would always buy just the mask. You could buy them for thirty nine cents separately from the uh, costume set. And. Uh, plus, in the Midwest, remember, on Halloween, sometimes it's really cold. So you would have to put your snowsuit over your Halloween costume anyway, which would completely ruin the, the illusion. Oh, man. Right, now, man. if you were smart, you would buy a Halloween costume two sizes too large so you could put it over your snowsuit. But then it would, <laughs> you know, rip and all that stuff. But it was uh, it was it was disappointing to go to all the work on your costume and then have to cover it up with a parka. Uh, so nobody could see it anyway. So I, I would always buy just the mask and I would make my own co I was, well, I call myself the godfather of cosplay. I was doing cosplay before cosplay was cool. <laughs> so I would, uh, I would make my own costume much, much the same way as I did my own Batman costume when I was a kid. Uh, I, I remember one year I was Thor and I'm looking at nice. the Thor mask from Ben Cooper right now. Now, the mask was very cool with the blonde hair and the winged helmets, and it said Thor on his helmet. Remember, <laughs> like some, sometimes the mask would actually have the name like printed right oh, on the mask. Man. Flash, secret squirrel, Thor, you know. So I had the Thor mask, but I said, no, I'm not wearing that dumb costume. Uh, so I made my own. I got a sweatshirt, and I put some circles on the, on the chest for the, for the thing, and I made my mom dye an old sheet red for my cape. And there, I remember we had an old chair that had fallen apart, like an old wood chair. And you know, the kind of support uh, dowel that's between the two legs to keep the legs steady. Uh, that had come out and I said, oh, this would be a good handle for a hammer. So I believe I took a Kleenex box and wrapped uh, electrical tape all around it, much to the chagrin of my father, uh, <laughs> and, and attached that box to the handle of that, the wood dowel from that old chair. And that was my hammer. So I went to school. And of course, they would have indoor uh, Halloween carnivals sometimes uh, where they'd have a parade. Everybody get together in the elementary school and get in the auditorium. And they'd go grade by grade and they would parade around the gym and show off their costumes. It was pretty cool. So I was, I was Thor. That was my Thor costume. But I never, never really appreciated the uh, costumes that actually came with the mask. I don't know how we got on this, but oh, Batman. Yeah. <laughs> so, but yeah, you're right. The 5%, I, I do digress. <laughs> uh, that's uh, that's some of the fun of you know growing up in those eras that you didn't have everything so readily available. It's like mm -hmm. uh, oh here's uh, here's some children's stormtrooper armor. We'll buy it on Amazon. Oh that, here you go. No, we yeah. used to you know have to think about melting down you know milk uh, jugs and uh, bending bending them to you know suit our you know make armor out of that. We we were way we didn't have any of this stuff, so it was uh, mm -hmm. this kind of mother uh, the mother of invention. Uh, this cosplay was born. <laughs> yes, exactly. And then when I got into my, my, my late teens and 20s, I actually did started making, because my grandmother was a very good seamstress, um, I would start, you know, making actual cosplay costumes, which, you know, got me beat up a lot.
But I was like, no, I really, I really want to dress. So I met Adam West in 1980. I was a radio DJ. I was 19. And it was one of the last probably seven or eight years that he was allowed to wear the costume and appear in, in costume as Batman. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I said, well, I was looking at his costume very carefully because I'd never seen it in person. I'd only just seen it on television. And I said, well, I could, I could probably make one of these. So the only access that I had to reference photos at the time, this is way back then, there was no internet, barely any magazines, and we didn't have a, a movie still store that I could just go down and buy movie stills and TV stills. I had the Viewmaster reels. Do you remember the 1966 Batman Viewmaster reels? Viewmaster, do you know what that yeah. is? Yeah, I saw some of them at the museum when we yeah. went to there. Uh, yeah, yes, those, those were mine. Um, oh, nice. I those, were nice. those were little reels that you would put in a little thing, and they were mm -hmm. stereo uh there were 3d pictures that you could hold up to a light and you could look at you know these things popping out at you it was really cool so as i'm trying to design my first batman costume well my second batman costume actually my actually my third batman costume <laughs> <laughs> why uh by the time I, that that's that's the sign of a real nerd by the time you're 26 you've made six batman costumes <laughs> that's a real sign of a dork um <laughs> <laughs> so not, not the army cap suit and not the Ben Cooper mask and cape playset, but this was my first foray into, I really want to make one of those Adam West Batman costumes. Mm -hmm. So I was holding the, uh, the Viewmaster up to the light, trying to figure out, and I'd sketch a little thing on a paper and I'd hold up to the light. Oh, okay, that's how they make the ears. Okay, sketch that out. So uh, I found a scuba hood made of neoprene and had my grandma cover that with uh, some uh, – navy blue satin coat lining that i'd found and she made the collar sewed the ears on it and uh, the cape and the whole bit i made the i had her trace out a pair of long underwear which was very easy to find in south dakota uh, <laughs> long underwear and you know one of those thermal tops and because uh, that fit you know pretty well for the for the tunic and i started working on the the belt and uh, started working on the gloves and and by the time 1981 rolled around, a year after I had met Adam, I had my own Batman costume, and I was cosplaying as the Adam West Batman. Yes, I will I'll go out on a limb right now and say that I was probably, most likely, the very first Adam West Batman cosplayer ever. Nice. So, uh, awesome. thank, thank nice. You, uh, let's hear it from me. That's everybody. awesome, yes, man. Because yeah, <laughs> um, everybody else, well, I remember when Adam was appearing in 1980 at World of Wheels, people were making kind of fun of him behind his back. They called me. And I was like, what are they saying? What, what, are they, what do they mean? But he's Batman. He's, he's a huge movie star. He's a Hollywood TV star. So I was, uh, I was very taken by him. Uh, but everybody was kind of making fun. And then, you know, of course, Adam had the last laugh because he became not only a legend, but an icon. Not everybody can. Mm -hmm. There are legends, but then there are icons. And Adam has become an icon. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was, <laughs> so I backed, I backed the right horse, I guess. So oh, yeah, the sure. year after that, in uh, March of 1981, World of Wheels was back again. No Adam West this time, but the Batmobile was there, one of the fiberglass touring Batmobiles. So I showed up in my Batman costume. I'm like, well, I want to get a picture, you know, standing, standing next to the Batmobile. Okay. This was, my, this was my endeavor. This was my goal for that day, to show up in my Batman costume and get a picture next to the Batmobile. I had no idea what was about ready to happen. <laughs> so I showed up and I walked in and people, it was like the Moses part of the Red Sea. People like, <laughs> like it was amazing. People like, oh, it's Batman, it's Batman. I'm like, what? Well, I'm not Adam West. They didn't care. It was the costume. Yeah. So yeah, I walk over to the Batmobile and I said, hey, can I get a picture with the Batmobile? The guy goes, yeah, you want to get in it? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I was like, what? What? Yeah, you get it. Come on, get in. We'll take some pictures. Uh, okay. So <laughs> I'm quaking with, with, fear and anticipation well not fear but just excitement mm -hmm. and i'm like i really like this so i i get the, he opens the door and i bang my knee on the uh on you know to, to get in it was really actually oh. quite small and mm -hmm. and having met adam i know that he was about six one i'm like well if i have a problem with it at, at you know six foot and he's an extra one or two inches taller than me at the time uh he must have really whacked his knee on this all the time getting in and out of it well mm -hmm. i got in and then immediate crowd gathered people all around snapping pictures of me behind the wheel of the Batmobile. Uh, it was life changing to where mm -hmm. I want to do more of this. We didn't even have a name for it. There was no cosplay or any of that stuff. It was just like, Oh yeah, that, that weird Wally kid, he's dressing up in strange costumes again. But I had done that ever <laughs> since I was a kid, I would run around <laughs> the neighborhood pretending to be Barnabas Collins and 
trying to bite the neighbor girls in the neck with my plastic fangs and <laughs> and uh, you know all the other kids were you know playing sports and kickball you and, wear a uh, costume when it's not halloween exactly <laughs> yes <laughs> call, call the therapist <laughs> something wrong with this kid uh but Boy. god bless god bless my parents for i'm sure they must have gotten some sort of crap from the neighbors about hey you're <laughs> Your boy ain't right in the head. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but they said, oh, no, he's just creative and he's blah, 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 whatever. But, yeah, then uh, I started on, on other costumes, Darth Vader. And uh, so man, I, every once in a while when I go to conventions, they ask me to you know give a speech or give a presentation or a panel or whatever. And I'll say, well, can I do my Godfather of Cosplay panel? And I'll bring my slideshow. And I have photographic proof of all this stuff happening from way back. And it's kind of a charmed life in that the things that I loved doing when I was a kid – actually did end up paying off later in my life some way, somehow. For example, the Muppet thing, learning to do all the Muppet voices and learning those characters and, and, and everything and having my own little puppet collection. Uh, my very first job on Family Guy was doing the voice of Bert from Sesame Street. Yeah, and I then, that scene. And then it, <laughs> well, Ernie, I hate it when you eat cookies in the damn bed. <laughs> so I thought, well, that was, you know, I, and they said, oh, Seth can do uh, Ernie, but he can't do Bert. And they're, they're looking for a Bert. They can't find a Bert. I'm like, I've done Bert since third grade. Come on, let's do this. So I auditioned Perfect. and then did the whole thing. And it was, uh, it got on and Seth had me come back to do some other voices after that. So it all worked. And then the whole puppeteering thing uh, worked to my advantage later when I became uh, a SAG member uh, because I worked on Murphy Brown doing a puppet character on the old TV show Murphy Brown. So my puppeteering skills actually got me my SAG card. So it all, it all awesome. comes around. Awesome. So it's, it's pretty cool. But yeah, Thanks, it, it, Reagan. All, it all started with Batman. <laughs> What's that? Didn't Reagan make it to where puppeteers could be part of SAG? Oh, uh, may, maybe. Because uh, they not... weren't considered actors before Reagan, actually. Really? Oh. I didn't know this. Well, yeah. Well, yeah. I, I believe that these, uh, well, these, <laughs> these puppeteers, uh, they're, they're <laughs> actors too, you know. And uh... <laughs> What is this punk rock? Yeah. Yeah. Wh wh what is this punk rock? Who are these punks and why are they rocking? <laughs> so, uh... <laughs> so anyway, he was, uh, no, I, I'm, a, I'm a big Reagan fan. I, I think he was, uh, he was great. Uh, but uh, that was uh, even more reason to like him, I guess, because uh, mm -hmm. puppeteers absolutely are actors, and yeah, as are cool. as are voice actors. You know, it's all acting, yeah. folks. You're doing absolutely. a character. You're For doing sure. a thing that's not you. If you're taking somebody else's words, some somebody's words that were written uh, by another guy, and you're speaking them as if they're coming out of your mouth, guess what? That's acting. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't matter if you have a puppet on your hand or you have a full costume on and you're on stage shout you know spouting shakespeare or if you're uh behind a microphone at warner brothers Studios saying riddle me this boys and girls you pathetic <laughs> clod <laughs> <laughs> so it just doesn't matter it's all uh it's all acting and uh it it always makes me laugh when people ask advice on how to get into voiceover i want to be a, a voice actor well have you done any acting no, no i don't want to do that i want to be a voice actor well voice mm. acting is act <laughs> so you got to kind of hone those expect? skills before you, yeah. So you kind of got to do that. So it's uh, they just oh people. It, it, this is the funny one that we all love. Uh, hi, um, Mr. Wingert. Uh, yeah, uh, people say that I have a really good voice that I should be in voice acting. Oh, well, I have a really nice pencil. Should I be a writer? <laughs> you gotta, have, you gotta have some sort yeah. of talent to behind Skill. that tool yeah. to push it. Yeah, so. Um, they, people don't really understand that, but yeah, act, act. If you're going to get into voice acting, act, 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 act all you can. And if you decide you don't want to wear a costume and put, you know, layers of makeup on your face and have them tease your hair and pull it and spray it. And you just mm -hmm. want to kind of act behind the microphone. That's a different kind of acting. That's fine. But learn how to use the skills that you've learned as an actor and then kind of tailor them into the voice acting world. Learn mic technique, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So it's, uh, it's pretty fascinating, but, um, Perfect. Yeah, it's it's uh, it it always kind of charms me that people uh, say, oh, I, people say I have a good voice. I should be a voice actor. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, really? Okay, well, yeah, that's yeah, all it takes, huh? Yeah, I got a really nice car. Should I be a NASCAR driver? <laughs> yeah, I work in practical effects as my uh, my daytime job, and yeah. we always get a kick out of people saying, um, "You guys must have a great time at Halloween." <laughs> yeah right <laughs> no frankly that's the time we dread the most because yes. every jackwad friend i've ever had has ca is calling me up going hey you got any costumes i can borrow no, no. yeah hey, can you make me a, can free. you make me a mask for halloween make up a mask 
Yeah, that'll that'll be twenty six hundred dollars, please. What? <laughs> Do you but make it, any Freddies, any Jasons? Yeah, that, exactly. Got it. Got any of them there, Michael Myers? Uh, the, you know the guy with the hockey mask. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> that always yes, kills me. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's Jason. When you're when you're you know Michael Myers, you're walking around. Hey, hey, Jason. <laughs> uh, I hate that. <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah, it's like I have a Starsky and Hutch Grand Torino, and sometimes people say, "Hey, Duke's a hazard. Duke's a hazard." Uh, no moron. It's Starsky and Hutch. Different show. <laughs> Um, well, but it's, uh, Batman is recognizable enough that nobody's really misconstruing that one. Or were well, they? Uh, the best? The, I always used the, the thing that always used to happen was they used to mistake um, Batgirl as Catgirl. They used to oh, hey Catgirl, man. Catgirl, hey Catgirl. Yeah. That, that's the one. And the Riddler and the Joker always get mixed up. Oh, oh my yeah. God. Hey, that's the true. Joker. I, I mean the Riddler. I mean uh, yeah. They always mix those two up, which was actually kind of one of the things that when the initial Arkham casting came down. That was the the headline in the breakdown was that it cannot sound anywhere near Mark's mm-hmm. Joker. We're looking for something completely different than Mark's Joker. So don't give us anything that's similar to the Joker because uh, they, yeah, there was yeah, that confusion sure, early sure. on, you know, yeah. and they wanted to keep it, you know, real separate. So they said, no, this, this Riddler is more like a game show host. He's this, he's that, he's, you know, self-important and blah, blah, blah. And he runs Batman through all these traps and these, things so i said oh okay well that's that's i i know exactly who this guy is and i i took um kind of melded two different personalities from people that i were was aware of in my uh life of studies one was an actor named uh, michael dunn who played dr loveless on an old show called wild wild west and he was uh, a little person but he was the arch nemesis of James West, the Secret Service agent. It was like James Bond in the Old West. Mm-hmm. Brilliant. Yeah. And Robert Conrad just passed away here this past year. Um, and he was great in this role. <clears throat> but Michael Dunn had the most, because you, you grow up and there's these villains who always say, I'm going to rend you limb from limb until your guts fall. And they were you know, seething and just enjoying it. But Michael Dunn had the most interesting lilt to his voice when he was saying the most horrible things like he was really enjoying this this was just part of his day like you and i would go i'm gonna go outside and walk the dog i might go get an ice cream cone it's gonna be a great day you know he was saying mr west i'm going to rend you limb from limb and then i'm going to hang you over a vat of acid it'll be wonderful he was just so (laughs) joyous about it and i'm like Mm -hmm. that's what the riddler would be this is his joy He's not going to see and be real. He will have those moments, but but this is his joy, one upping you know Batman and all the other morons in his life that he considers <laughs> you know, him mentally. And I said I'm going to give him such absolute joy when he's talking about this stuff, and and resist the temptation to go the other way, you know, to where you you want to be you know real mean and evil with the with the dark evil voice. Um, And the other uh, aspect was a guy that I'd worked with in theater in the Midwest who um, was quite the pompous jackwad. Um, (laughs) He, um, well, I can't say much about him because people may, may then find out who he is. A pompous guy in theater. Yeah, no, yeah, no kidding. (laughs) How could that be? How could that be? Say it isn't so. I don't believe it. (laughs) But he would, he would, uh, he would, uh, pick his beard and smoke a cigarette and he was very thoughtful and you could see him picking his beard and thinking and he'd take a puff off his cigarette and he'd pick his beard and he'd walk around and every word that he said was just so important he loved hearing himself talk so he'd walk around and he'd say i think we're all up to performance quality (laughs) (laughs) take a drag off a cigarette with the possible exception of wally Oh so, my God. <laughs> but he was slow and methodical and he would say, and he would just, every word would just drip out of his mouth because everything it's like he Lumberg said. like Lumberg in Office Space. Yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Oh, come on <laughs> Saturday. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so that was, that was this guy. And I, I combined Michael Dunn and this guy and I said, well, I, that's how I see this guy based on the stuff that they had written. And, uh, you know, the Riddler loves to hear himself talk. He just loves to, to like pour out every word. Every word that drips out of his uh, godforsaken mouth is just all su- so super intelligent and so overly important. And I said, <laughs> that's a good quality for him is to just have that. Well, Batman, here we are again. Isn't this quaint? 
well, you've really done it this time, Dark Knight. Yes, you have. <laughs> you know, just that, <laughs> that musicality <laughs> where he's just, yeah, this is going to be so fun. He's toying with him because I know in my mind that I've got the end game and it's going to be fun and the game's going to go to my benefit. It's mm -hmm. all, uh, all fun stuff. So uh, anyway, that was that was uh, kind of the genesis of, of that. But uh. oh, that's awesome! I remember when I first started playing the game, how uh, you know Ke Kevin was already Batman, Mark was already Joker, Arlene was already Harley. So I just assumed that Riddler was going to be John Glover when I came on. But then when I heard the voice come on, I'm really like, well, it's not the guy from the animated series, but it's definitely feels like the Riddler. Like that's 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 exactly who he would be. Just well, off the first. Well, thank you. Th yeah, thank you for that. Um. D d how many Riddler episodes were there in the animated series? I I, I only remember one. There were uh, three before they uh, revamped the art, and then he made a couple of, like cameo appearances. Oh, but oh, uh, there wasn't really that much with yeah. uh, John Glover's Riddler. It's it's the Riddler's an interesting character because for the most part nobody's really n has known what to do with him. It's mm. uh, and that's why the the problem in the game was like, well, we kind of know who the Joker is, we know who the who Catwoman is, we know all these other characters, but. Yeah, the Riddler, he just uh, has these riddles, but he's not really strong. He's he's not going to beat you up. Um, and he's not the Joker. He's not too maniacally crazy with makeup on his face. What do you do with this guy that just runs around in green tights? And uh, it's really kind of hard to, to kind of lock in. Luckily, the 66 uh, series with uh, Gorshin, that was the very first uh, villain that you saw in the, in the show. Mm -hmm. And he was so amazing as the Riddler and just gave him so much depth okay. and insanity and, and mania. He actually appeared before the Joker. So he kind of yeah, set right, the standard right. for what the rest of the villains would be on that show. Yeah. First, the, first episode, right? Yeah. The, yeah. The, since the pilot. Hi, yeah. little yeah. Riddle. Smack in the middle. <laughs> Tell me this, Batman, you cow clod. There are three men in a boat with four cigarettes, but no matches. How do they manage to smoke? Hmm? <laughs> <laughs> uh, perfect. that's another thing too is when i was a kid i went to woolworth's in mitchell south dakota and they had for a dollar in the in the bargain bin the batman soundtrack on lp well that's i awesome. bought it oh, and man. uh listened to war the grooves out of it oh man and, uh, that's awesome yeah so was, so when i got to you know audition for the gorshin riddler for the two feature films mm -hmm. i actually did the riddler uh, bit that's on that record i recreated it and you know oh, really? affected awesome. my voice to sound like it's coming through a you know a tape recorder speaker so, so was, what was the what was the specific bit that was in the in that album um there was um uh the one that i just did there are three men in a boat before oh okay. uh but but it started off with because that that album was so great in that it included voice clips from the tv show now normally you'd buy a soundtrack for a movie or a tv show and there'd be no voices it would just be the music because right. they'd have to pay the actors a separate fee, you know, if they're going to appear on the record too. So, but it had the voices of Adam and Bert. No Cesar Romero, strangely enough, had Zelda the Great, had Burgess Meredith as the Penguin, had George Sanders as Mr. Freeze. And they, they started off with, before you trip over your cape, Batman, riddle me this. There are three men in a boat with four cigarettes, but no matches. How do they manage to smoke? Mm -hmm. And then he laughs. And then you hear Adam go, the Riddler, you know, and uh, <laughs> the Riddler. And then they go into like a music thing. And then it comes back um, from at the end of the music. And then, then Robin repeats the riddle. Uh, there are four cigarettes, uh, three men about four cigarettes, no matches. How do they manage to smoke? Uh, they threw one cigarette overboard and made the boat a cigarette lighter. <laughs> <laughs> and you hear the Riddler go, correct, boy wonder. <laughs> and it was, oh, man. Like I said, I wore the grooves out of that album. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, so going back to the 66, um, the, so a lot, as our listeners are picking up, obviously there's a lot more to your role in the Batman universe than the voice of the Riddler in, in this. Uh, you and, as you mentioned, you and Adam West were friends for uh, 37 years. You even did a song about him. There's a touching tribute on your website uh, that uh, will direct uh, our listeners to on uh, wallyontheweb.com uh out of curiosity we were wondering since uh you knew adam what were his thoughts on some of his successors whether it was michael keaton christian bale kevin conroy what well were his, uh, opinions yeah on them? I, I never talked to him about um uh kevin conroy or christian bale or any of the other ones but i know that you know the michael keaton thing uh he never disparaged it at least to me 
any of the other Batmans. He just realized that it was a, a quite a different Batman mm-hmm. than what they were doing in the 60s. But the fact that he was just kind of unceremoniously just ignored mm-hmm. by, I mean, look at, look at how great Stan Lee's cameos were yeah. in the Marvel films. Right. Why could they have not had Adam coming in in all of those Batman films as like a different character every film? And I know that I he, did, yeah, yeah he, I, I did read something on this actually. Yeah. Oh, what did uh, it say? Well, uh, the producer Michael Uslan, who's the the producer who was trying to get a Batman movie off the ground for years, he did actually want Adam to be Thomas Wayne in uh, the Tim Burton Batman. That's y- awesome. You know, you know why? You know why that is the real reason? So they could, uh, so they could shoot him. him off. <laughs> so they could shoot him. Yeah, and kill him off. Jeez. So they could shoot him on screen and going. And, and in a symbolic way, say, look, this is old Batman. He's dead. This is new Batman. So Adam uh, didn't uh, take that for that very reason, because he didn't want the fans of the TV show to see basically symbolically that Batman being killed. Ah, uh, gotcha. Uh, so uh, I think that it would have been there's a Batman story out there that I read many years later where Bruce Wayne is looking through some old movie footage uh, for home movies. Mm-hmm. And he sees uh, his parents at a millionaire's party for a fundraiser. And uh, thugs come in, break into the party and steal everybody's jewelry. But Thomas Wayne, who just decided for some reason to go to the masquerade as dressed as a bat, bat yes, <laughs> uh, jumps into action. And you see everybody shooting movie footage of this. I mean, the oh, comic book's great. Shooting movie footage yes, of, of this. So there's actual, he says, wow, he was the first Batman. It was, it was mm-hmm. meant to be. Yeah. So... I thought that would be a cool throwback to see Adam dressed up as that, but not to actually see him get shot on right. film well, would not have been it, probably, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. It would have, it probably would have taken you out, especially as <laughs> as people who love the 66 show, just to see him for, because it's like in, in the actual movie, he's like on screen for like a minute and then he gets shot as, as usual. Yeah, on yeah. It. But uh, they did manage to, have you seen, um, the Brave and the Bold episode where Adam was uh, Thomas Wayne. Uh, I have not, uh, uh, but it's but I but that's that's um, that it was James Tucker uh, who's who's <laughs> yeah. a bro, who's a genius and he uh, James and I worked on well he cast me for the for the feature for film. the sixty six stuff yeah. yeah yeah exactly and he's as much of a fan of that as you and I are so mm-hmm. that yeah he he has a really good sensibility for that that whole historical relevance of that but yeah, yeah. seeing Adam get shot on camera would have been weird now is, is in the brave and bold episode does do you see him go down and get shot uh well it's since it's for kids it's off screen oh but, yeah yeah uh you do see the story that you just told us about oh interesting so and it's adam as batman with uh there, there's some they play around with time a bit but he basically gets to team up with the the bruce wayne batman Oh, so, I got to see this. You should, you should check that out. Cause that's, well, I'm going to buy that whole really series, special. I think, on uh, on yeah. DVD. I, I, nice. I'm real curious about that because it has a great it's a, look. It's a special – yeah, it's a very special episode. Julie Newmar is Martha. Right. Kevin Conroy and Mark Hamill are uh, Phantom Stranger and the Spectre. Oh, uh, as that's well. awesome. So everybody's in that it's it's one of the – it's hailed as one of the greatest episodes yeah. of, the, of that See, show. that's what I wanted to see. There's two Batman things that – exist in the in the lore that they'll probably never make any movies because they're too busy trying to make it moody yes. <laughs> who cares dark and gritty yeah i want to see man bat because that's yeah. always been one of my favorite villains and with cgi now you could do a great man bat and i want i've always wanted to see that you know they the thomas wayne uh, super f- footage you know super eight movie footage of him at the mm-hmm. costume party for right out of the comic book yeah. Uh, but they'll probably never, you know, probably never do those. Of course, Adam's, you know, yeah. gone now anyway, so it's pointless. But you know, now they'd have Michael Keaton do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. He's, he's, he's everybody's going. retro Batman now, you know. Yeah. Kind <laughs> of, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's what they, they should have done. But, uh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So. You anyway. were uh, you were not only friends with Adam West, but also with Frank Gorshin, correct? I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about your friendship with him. Do you have any stories about, about Frank Gorshin? Yeah, he was uh, he was charmingly surly. Um, <laughs> he was just like kind of surly, and you know, he uh, we, we had him over here one night to watch some uh, some Batman episodes, 
And uh-huh. uh, we watched the very first one, you know, where the Riddler is down in the sewer and he pops up through the manhole. And, and one of my friends said, uh, hey, Frank, did, were you really down in a sewer to pop up through a manhole or how, how'd you get down there? He goes, I don't remember. <laughs> he, he really had no recollection of uh, it was the 60s <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah after all it was the 60s but he said he said he had a funny line from you know he's running around in the in the riddler suit with all the question marks all over his body and he's walking through the lot and he sees an old friend of his and the guy goes hey frank are you working <laughs> he was like and he's thinking what a ridiculous absurd question to ask as i'm dressed like this no i just dress like this all the time yeah are you working this is my suit <laughs> yeah of course i'm working and he said that uh they said frank wh- where'd you get all the energy uh, you know as the riddler to, uh, that's great energy you're always bouncing around he says well that that costume was so tight i had to keep moving. I didn't want any anybody to see anything. <laughs> oh my God! You know, okay. because uh, the costume's so tight and it showed everything off. And he's like, I had to keep moving, otherwise people would see stuff, you know, that they didn't want to see. <laughs> so uh, yeah, it was oh, it was kind of right. kind of interesting. But his uh, girlfriend at the time, when she came over here, she was used to you know older Frank, who was more sedate, and you know here he is on the screen bouncing around like he's a maniac, and she just kept laughing like Frank, you you, you look like a bug. <laughs> like, like he's just like jumping and huh? hopping around like a, like some sort of crazy bug. Uh, so that was, that was kind of a funny line, but yeah, he was, he was a good guy and, uh, but you know, charmingly surly. Mm-hmm. Yeah. He let you know if he wasn't happy about something. Julie Newmar and I went to, um, well, she was in New York for a convention. So was uh, Adam and so was Malachi Throne, but excuse me, Julie and I actually got tickets to see Say Goodnight Gracie on Broadway. Wow. So uh, we I got a got a limo and we went from the hotel in uh, New Jersey or wherever we were at, and uh, drove into the city and uh, saw you know say goodnight Gracie, and um, you know people were like oh it's Julie Newmar it's Julie Newmar, so you know somebody sitting in front of us turned around and before the show started and said, well I I bet you uh, you know this guy really well huh meaning Frank Gorshin, mm-hmm. and I'm thinking no. She she knows Frank through the autograph shows, but they were never on on screen together as the uh, Catwoman of the Riddler. Oh, so true. that was just yeah, never, right, yeah. Right, right, right. So, but yeah, we went down uh, backstage afterwards, and uh, it was really uh, it was great. And the thing, yeah. and Frank was really happy to see us, and he loved seeing Julie, but he was very very disappointed that Adam was in town and Fred Westbrook was in town doing the show, and they didn't come see him, and he was very oh. disappointed by that. Oh, that was man. kind of secretly, yeah. So if, if, you know, if Fred and Adam would have had their druthers, they probably would have chosen to, to, you know, spend their evening, you know, in the city doing that. But, you know, it was just kind of um, the case where, you know, if you're doing an autograph show, you know, you're kind of busy and you're, you know, busy all day and talking to people. And at the end of the day, you kind of just want to relax, but, Mm -hmm. you know, so (laughs) get some sleep and get some rest. So I can kind of see that, but. Yeah, Adam and Frank had been friends uh, for a long time, and it probably would have been good for Adam to maybe make the gesture, but I don't know. Mm-hmm. I, I think Adam probably, if he'd have had his druthers, like I said, would have maybe done it differently, but who knows? Mm. Who knows? Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. But, but boy, uh, uh, Gorshin was brilliant in that role as uh, yeah. as George Burns, yeah. too. Yeah. Now, is he uh, the reason why Riddler went from the bodysuit to the business suit? Uh, yes. He told, apparently Jan Kemp said, that Frank came to him and said, Jan, can you, can you get me out of this? <laughs> this is leotards. <laughs> Just, it's, you know, it's, you know it's, people are, this is, uh, this, this costume is so tight. People can tell my religion. The Catholic <laughs> league is going to come after me next. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. League of decency is going to come after him next. So that's, so, uh, yeah, that's why Jan Kemp designed the suit with the question marks and the whole thing and the derby. Mm-hmm. So, um, uh, yeah. Nice. Well, That's cool. Otherwise, your Arkham Riddler would be in spandex. Yeah, probably not a good <laughs> idea. But you know that that guy's like so so skinny. It's it's funny, and, and they change his look through, from game to game to game. It's really kind of amazing. Yeah, I noticed that too. You start yeah. off looking like Brian Cranston or uh, Hugh Laurie, and then he ended up looking like Charlie Sheen for some reason. He does right in right. Arkham Knight? Yeah. Yeah. Very very strange. That's how worn down his psyche has been. Right. By the time we get there. Right. So it was, uh, but it's, I love that character. I just wish I, I would do that the rest of my life if I, if I could, but you know, they, everybody who takes over um, the franchise, they want to put their own fingerprint on it, have their own actors, you know, do it. And they, mm-hmm. they don't want to have to be married to anybody else's, you know, prior 
casting things or whatever. Yeah, we see that a lot. So, uh, yeah, whatever. Uh, That's kind of the nature of the biz, but whatever. Yeah. Uh, we'll take a brief detour from the, some of the other questions on some of your other roles. So, sort of off topic, but uh, my roommate and I are Invader Zim fans. So oh, I yeah. <laughs> ask about your experience as the almighty tallest red on the show and what ideas for that show that didn't end up making it on there. Uh, I think every I- – well – the ideas that didn't make it usually had something to do with some sort of uh, bodily orifice or um, <laughs> some sort of limb being uh, ripped from a body or something. Uh, J- Jonan's uh, dark sensibilities uh, had to constantly be uh, reined in, I think. But still, a lot of the stuff ma- you know made it on the air, which was kind of <laughs> really yeah. it, dark harvest. They're they're seriously killing kids and harvesting their organs. Okay, I get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hey, wh- where's the Rugrats? <laughs> Can, what happened to Rugrats? Where's Cat Dog? Why where's are, why Doug? Are, yeah, where's yeah. Doug? Why are we seeing? Where's Hey Arnold? Why are we seeing kids getting their organs harvested? It was just so, so unlike anything that had been on uh, previously mm-hmm. or before. But I, I had said on stage at the Comic Con in San Diego a couple of years ago when we did the Zim panel uh, that the reason Adventure Time and the reason a lot of these other shows are getting away with the stuff that they're getting away with, not, not necessarily dark stuff or vulgar stuff, but just stuff that wouldn't be traditionally in kid kiddie cartoons. The reason they're now getting away with that is because Jonan Vasquez blazed the trail. Mm-hmm. It was Invader right. Zim that blazed the trail for like, oh, you mean we don't have to have a rabbit and a duck uh, fighting each other through the whole thing or just doing these little inane adventures. We can be a little more edgy and a little more out there and kids are going to go, okay, it's fantasy. I kind of get it. And uh, it's uh, yeah, I, I totally believe that uh, invaders in blaze the trail for all the other uh, cartoons that came later to kind of expand uh, what, what they were doing. And uh, same as how I feel about Seth MacFarlane blazing a trail with family guy. Cause you know, you had the Simpsons and they were, semi edgy but seth just kind of ran up to that wall walked on the wall and then went on the other side of the wall and just kept on running you know for, just crashed through it with oh yeah yeah for yeah right <laughs> oh no oh no oh no <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> and he looks around he just kind of gently backs out that's brilliant yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I also heard of an idea that did make it in of the tallest not actually being tall uh, yes, that was the rumor that was exoskeletons mm-hmm. that they actually had. It was just two guys who were short like all the other ones, but they had had these cool you know suits that they would wear to make them look tall. But uh, I, I just I, I love his explanation that um, they're exactly the same height. And <laughs> and on Urk, you rule based on how tall you are. And they were exactly the same height. So I'm like, all right, well, I guess, guess we're both leaders. So that's how they that's how they lucked into that position, but it's uh it's really funny that I'm always asked and I still am to this day, um are the tallest lovers are they it's like <laughs> so I so I asked Joan and I'm like well that's, you know back in the day I was like well that's a good question, so I asked Joan and I said so are they are they a couple are they what's going on he says no, none of that love none of that romance none of that sex stuff exists on Urk people are you know the the Urkins are made from machines the in tubes there's no procreation there's no um, none of that stuff has happened. So it's not even on, it's not even part of their existence. So I'm like, all right, well, that's a good explanation. So I f- anyway, I so feel I, like I've, I feel like I've missed out on, I'm sorry, I haven't actually seen Invader Zim and I was an avid, huge Nick fan up until around the cat dog era. And oh. I guess because of my age or I don't know what happened, but I just stopped watching Nick loading quite as much. But you discovered until, girls. Yeah, maybe like, like from, from like, Ren and Stimpy up until Cat Dog, pretty much. I every single show on that channel, I just consumed to hell and back. Yeah. But I, I guess I sort of missed the Invader Zim years. Were Maybe you a I, Real Monsters fan? Real Monsters, yes, man. Yeah. Crumb, uh, what was his name? Ickus. Uh, you know, they were part of the Snick lineup, right? Sure. And yeah. and I was I was huge into that. But uh, Invader Zim, I, I think I kind of missed. I think. Yeah, well, it, it's um, the nice thing about it is the uh, the girls who are about six or seven uh, when they were watching the show at the time are now 27. Hey, so, uh, <laughs> I, uh, it's always fun to you know do conventions and uh, hey, 
<laughs> Here's my number. Yeah, exactly. Here's my, my room Instagram. number. Instagram. Yeah, yeah. So DM. it's uh, no, no, seriously though, it's uh, it it's cool that um, it doesn't seem like that was twenty some odd years ago, but it it was. Right, and, right. You know, right. time flies, and it's. Um, I I knew that at the time when the show ended that it wasn't probably over. I said, yes, yeah, I think mm-hmm. this might come back. It's just ahead of its time. Because simultaneously at the same time, I was on Family Guy and the same thing happened after three seasons, they got canceled. And I said, yeah, yeah this is going to come back. You watch, it's just a little bit ahead of its time. And right, uh, cause right, I, right. I called it the Rugrats syndrome cause Rugrats was canceled. And then, you know, the reruns made it popular again. So they brought it back into production. So, um, I thought, you know, well, when the family guy thing got canceled, I said, nah, it's, it's going to come back. You, you watch. It's going to be uncanceled. It's going to have the Rugrats syndrome. And sure enough, you know, so. Yeah. It's now going to be on forever. But, <laughs> exactly. But Zim, yeah, for better or worse. But Zim is great in that um, I, I think that being – you know, the marketplace being what it is now, there's definitely a market for a Zim series on Netflix. For and sure. Nickelodeon yeah. has this great yeah. content deal now with Netflix and they had this Florpus movie, which broke yeah, records. Yeah. Florpus was like the number six best, voted the numbers, the sixth best animated project of the entire year, that year. Oh, wow. You know what I mean? Of uh, 2019. And mm-hmm. it was the only Nickelodeon project that had gotten in the top 10. Um, That's awesome. Which was, yeah, all the rest were, you know, the Disney features, the Pixar. Oh, and or the Florpus. So it's, it's, yeah. I, I just, I would be really, really surprised if Netflix didn't want to think about maybe doing another Zim series. Well, we are, we are mainly a, 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 pro, a Batman podcast for sure, but we wanted to acknowledge that you're also a part of the Marvel universe as Ant Man and Modok. So I was just wondering what led to you being Hank Pym, Ant-Man uh, in Avengers Earth Mightiest Heroes? Well, there's a really cool guy that I've known for a long time named Jamie Simone, who uh, started off at Saban uh, nice. as the dubbing uh, director for a lot of the stuff that they would get overseas. And then he set up his own studio called Studiopolis, Studiopolis that would... Um, you know, again, dub anime and dub foreign projects, but then he started um, branching out into original animation. And he's a terrific director. He had done some, some directing of video games, but they brought him this Earth's Mightiest Heroes show and they said, we're gonna cast it with people that you wouldn't ordinarily, you know, feel are these characters. We're not gonna use the usual Saturday morning uh, TV voice guys. Uh, we're gonna go with, you know, actors who sound like the characters just without putting on any sort of voice. So they were having a real hard time casting uh, Hank Pym Ant-Man. They needed somebody who didn't sound square-jawed, as Jamie says, uh, who didn't sound like Thor or Captain America. And they needed a vulnerability. And the way Pym was going to be written was that he was a bit of a pacifist. And huh. he was like, no, it's, you know, I don't want to, we use science for to better our lives we don't use it for domination or for fighting or any of that stuff and you know pim was was basically a real pacifist in that show and you know he went along kind of reluctantly with the avengers to use his science for you know force but he realized no there's some bad stuff happening and i kind of need to do that and if you remember when he had the original ultrons they were just worker bees in his Mm -hmm. mini uh prison you know, because he'd, he'd shrink the prison down. They put all the bad guys in the prison and then shrink it down, you know, to the size of an iPod. <laughs> right. And then, uh, you know, there's, there's the prison. And if you ever want to go in, you have to shrink down, you go in or whatever. But he had all these Ultron bots, which actually had his voice to start, which was, uh, I think, Jamie's idea that, no, if Pym had Ultrons and they were peaceful, just worker bees, they would have his voice. But then when he turned, you know, when they put the, the chip in Ultron so he would be able to fight, you know, the yeah. Kree or the Skrull or whatever. Um, then his eyes turned red and then he took on like kind of a different, like more deeper, like more a mean voice. And it was, it was really, really kind of brilliant um, that uh, it kind of, kind of like Gurr, you know, when Gurr goes from stupid Gurr to fighting Gurr, you know, his eyes turn red and he, he has those three or four seconds where he's a warrior and then he clicks back into, I want chili. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I want yeah. tacos. You know, <laughs> 
So it was kind of a cool thing. So they, they were really trying to find somebody with the sensibility, the sensitivity and the vulnerability that they needed Pim because I feel, and it's not just because I got to be this character, but I feel of all the Avengers in that, in that world where it's not Scott Lang as, as Ant-Man, but it's actually Hank Pym as the original Ant-Man. He had the best story arc of any of those characters. If you think about it, Captain America is pretty much Captain America. <laughs> Hulk is pretty much Hulk. Hulk. Thor, <laughs> pretty much Thor. I mean, they all have kind of the same. You know, Clint has a pretty good arc. Uh, Black Widow has a pretty good arc. Some of the, but, mm -hmm. but if you think about Pym, he has the best character arc of any of those characters. He starts off kind of a pacifist, a scientist. No, I don't want to use my science for, for, for bad or for, for violence. I want it to only be for good. Okay, well, maybe a little bit of violence, but it's got to be only for, you know, to defeat evil. Okay. And then he's like, okay, well, and he's, you know, working on, then he fakes his death because he goes crazy. And then he comes back as yellow jacket and now he's really yes. violent. And now he's a little nuts. I'm like, this is the greatest character in comic book history. <laughs> Forget all the others. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So if you really think about it, his arc is much better than any yeah, of the, the other Avengers. They do make him way more interesting than the uh, yeah. version of the movies. Uh, exactly. And that was what was so great about playing him in that, in that show was in the uh, 52 episodes of Earth Mightiest Heroes is that you really did get to kind of run the gamut of everything. You got to be, mm -hmm. you know, kind of the absent-minded professor. You got to be the superhero. You got to be the, the, the vigilante, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, yellow jacket. You get to, uh, you know, it's like where the, uh, I think it was with um, yellow jacket was with, it's deep into second season, but he, there's this bomb that's going to go off and, uh, he, they don't know what to do and a lot of the other characters are running around what do we do what do we do and about two seconds before the bomb goes off he shrinks the bomb and it just kind of goes boop, in his hand <laughs> and i think like the one of the other the girl characters so like slaps him is like how dare you and he's just kind of like laugh watching them just be tortured <laughs> for that two minutes while they thought the bomb was going to explode and it just kind of goes boop, in his hand he's like eh. i love that what a great uh what a great what series a what a great yeah yeah what a great series awesome and that is the first half of our special interview with Wally Wingert. Tune in next time to find out the rest of it. But uh, in the meantime, uh, he is a wealth of information, isn't he? <laughs> yeah, uh, it was. I, I love, I love when guests are like just keep it going, you know. And like he was obviously one of those guys, and just have like a lot of stories to tell. And mm -hmm. definitely, I mean, obviously for a podcast, somebody that's uh, a voice actor, that's definitely gonna be like a huge plus. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, thanks for setting this up, Ben. Of course. Um, fucking great. Um, I yes. love his Riddler. Um, that's Same. the thing. I probably heard him from other stuff before that, but mm -hmm. I think this is kind of like his main role, wouldn't you say, these days? Like he's. Unless uh, something more amazing comes along, like this is kind of like his top one, right? At the yeah, moment? yeah, and uh, I think a lot of people who are who only know his name through the Riddler are going to be surprised in terms of how deep his background is with the rest of Batman fandom on this. So, uh, thanks again for coming on, and the rest of you guys can hear the rest of this uh, next week. But in the meantime, uh, as you guys have seen, we have changed our name to Superhero Stuff You Should Know. Uh, and as such, we are changing our social media handles as well. So you can now find us on Twitter at Superhero Stuff Pod, as well as on Instagram as Superhero Stuff Pod. Uh, shout outs to a few of our followers on Instagram. That's Egyptian Magdi, uh, Logan N N N N N underscore H, Heck Tor MF Nine, and uh, Sammy Samurai. That's Sammy with an I. Over to you, Andrew. Yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for listening, and uh, I would like everybody to go over to, to uh, patreon.com sl uh, slash superhousepodcast, and you can join the Shasta Army there for just a uh, dollar a month, our $1 tier. Uh, we will update that to have uh, a $5 tier soon. Just you wait. <laughs> and um, and I'd like to also thank Kooky Noms, Matt Herring, and Elijah B. Mm -hmm. Also, uh, if you would... Uh, we would love for you to leave us a review on iTunes. Um, that really increases our visibility. It seems like it won't do much, but it actually really does help. So 
please uh, leave a comment in the iTunes store. And uh, I guess Spotify is really coming up because they just they just uh, got Rogan for like something ridiculous, like a hundred million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, maybe leave us a review in the Spotify store, uh, whatever or whatever you know. <laughs> so um, I don't know how the exact details on that one, but yeah. Um, <laughs> I don't know if there's a Spotify store, but. Yeah, I Spotify. Uh, yeah. In in Spotify, a rating mm. in Spotify or whatever. Mm. Yeah, whatever it is. Mm. And um, and uh, also, I'd love for you to take out your phone and uh, open up your voice recorder app, and then leave us a message. Record a message for us that goes something like, "I love superhero. I love superhero stuff. You should know." Or "Superhero stuff is superhero stuff. You you should know is awesome." Or anything like that. And uh, send that you press the share button from there and then share that to superhouse podcast at gmail.com that is one word all together superhouse podcast at gmail.com and uh, share that voice recording to that gmail and we will put that on our podcast and so you too can be a part of of this here show so uh we'd love for that to happen and then uh also uh i'm thunderwolf drew on instagram and twitter please search for either superhouse podcast or superhero stuff you should know on uh youtube and you will find us there mm -hmm. and uh, i'd like to thank everybody joining us uh from uh the facebook groups and things like that um and uh, that that's uh, been really great recently. And that's pretty much it from me, I think. Uh, this is Andrew signing off. This is Ben signing off. Yeah.